So this is a, a book review for uh, a book by Steven Pinker. Uh, it's named as How the Mind Works. About the author, Steven Pinker is an experimental psychologist who conducts research in visual cognition, psychology, social relations. Steven Pinker is the professor in Department of Psychology at Harvard University. He is elected uh, member of National Academy of Science and has uh, two time is a two time uh, Pulitzer Prize finalist and uh, uh, Pulitzer. Yeah. So. Not saying, but let it come out. It's it's not saying. No. It's not saying like I, I already. You, I guess. Yes. I believe you stop sharing it this year. So, so. Okay, so the mind paradox he talks about in the very first chapter is that we we are able to uh, achieve many feats like landing on the moon and uh, defining what a gene sequence is and uh, doing all these works. But we have a paradox that uh, why is the thought of even eating worms is disgusting? Why do we still believe in ghosts and spirits? And why do we fall in love? So these are kind of uh, questions that that we find hard to answer, and we still are able to achieve these things. He is trying he tries to explain how our mind works on the lines of this question for better understanding, and uh, how he does it in a beautiful way by bringing computational theory and by bringing uh, evolutionary theory and what he thinks about the mind and the body is is amazing that. That will go through in this life. So, so the three key ideas. Stop the when was this book published? Uh, 1997. 1997. Okay. So the three key ideas that he wants to talk about is computational theory of mind, the evolution, uh, the evolution, and is one that he talks about is specialization. So uh, I'll go through the slides to better explain this. And computational theory he says it's information processing. Or evolution is how do we explain a complex device? Uh, he used evolu evolution to explain how uh, how the mind works through reverse engineering it, what we were designed to do and how we are working right now. And it says that uh, in terms of specialization, like the brain is not specialized, uh, the mind is not specialized and uh, mind, just like body, has different parts and he calls it the mental body. And different parts of a mental body does different kind of things. So, so it is specialized? Or is it it's not specialized like a body is uh, consists of lungs and heart. Right. Uh, right. So uh, a heart, the work of heart cannot be done by lungs, and the lungs work cannot be done by heart. So, so it's not specialized. It says that it is the mind has mental organ. Yes. And it does those uh, things differently, and they sort of compete with each other in order to uh, to. To do what it does. That's what I would expect him to say. So yeah. it seems odd for you for him to for you to say that it's not specialized because it's, he's a modularity of mind guy. Yes. That's that should have come up. But he says he says that it's not specialized and it's specialized also, but okay. I'll, I'll explain it better. All right. Yeah. So the mind body problem. So in computational theory of mind, uh, the mind is uh, a piece of uh, information that process information like beliefs and desires are colorless, orderless, and tasteless things, but they still cause behavior. Similarly, information being a mathematical concept which derives from new truth, uh, new, which derives new truth from the old truth can also cause behavior and it is tasteless, orderless, and colorless. 
that causes behavior. So this is the sort of analogy he draws from the start uh, that our mind, our, uh, our uh, information, our brain is an information processing system, and uh, and uh, this is this is the analogy. Uh, <laughs> so human brain is uh, is not a digital computer. We have seen many uh, many differences in between them. Like uh, like in this class, we have also said brain is parallel. Computers are serial with a S. Uh, computers are what is serial? S. I don't. I don't. <laughs> This is Mr. You made or he? I mean, I mean, I mean. Computers are fast. Elements of brain are comparatively slow. Computers run screensaver with stars. Brains don't. As bad as the metaphor can be between uh, the digital computer and a human brain, we. No, what do you mean? With stars, brain. Uh, computers run screensavers, Doctor said. Brains don't. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, stars on on computer screens. There's screensavers. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So brains don't brains don't do that. So the comma here. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> Come on, man. Okay. So as a, as a as a as bad as metaphor can be, uh, the part we think that what makes a computer smart can also be applied to what makes a brain smart. We we evaluate both of them on on a similar construct. What a brain does and what a mind does. So <coughs> as bad as metaphor, it is. We'll still see uh, both of them on a similar level of evaluation. Did he say this exactly this way? Yes. What makes computers smart can also be applied. I, yes. What makes for, for his uh, basically learning from computers are applied. You know? No. Uh, but basic. What, Creating an analogy that brings. Yes. But it could be different. Right? You can learn from human brain. So, yeah, well, this is 1997, yeah. uh, which is important. Um, and, and, and he sees himself as a bad metaphor, but uh, I want to do it. This at, at the time, the, the computer metaphor for mind was still pretty prevalent. In 1997. Oh. Because if you see at that time, like uh, there used to be human calculators at that time also. And well, when yeah, like people did these manual computation and they just compare it with the yes. uh, computers that who is faster, human or computer. Even, so right. Yeah, mm -hmm. even at the NASA, they have human computers. At that. Uh, okay, so. Uh, the first thing that we see uh, human, uh, the brain as a computational power is the human eye. The retinal images in, in our retina are upside down and information is the only property or activity of the brain. It doesn't matter if the image is upside down or not upside down. The mind runs on information. So it takes away those patches of, uh, uh, those patches of uh, colors and uh, in the, in the, in the tissue, which is light sensitive and process that that information and it constructs a 3D image of the world that we see right now. So, so we are, uh, we are a com computer. The mind is a computational processing system. It explains by giving the example of the human eye. And he further explains uh, Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, evolution, science and engineering in the natural world. Or what Darwin's theory said that uh, physical replicators, which Did compete for, huh? Talk about not engineering, but it's a natural engineering. He, he explained it like that. It's not the actual theory of uh, evolution. It's what he suggests that we should see right now in order to construct uh, a story ar along his book. Physical replicators which compete for limited resources, the one which has the highest reproduction rate will prevail for many generations. The results of such natural engineering will mimic in many ways of man-made engineering. He says that, and that's how he draws analogy from evolution to mind the, as a process of engineering. What exactly is the thing from Yeah, I'll explain further. So, and psychology as a as a reverse engineering of mind that he has suggested 
to understand its function and what is natural selection built it to do and uh, then in the natural evolution it was engineered for survival in the environment So what kind of problems our mind uh, regularly focuses on? These are listed some uh, which were taken from evolution uh, and uh, and general problems itself, like seeing in the third dimensional space, moving arms and legs in the physical world so that we don't stumble, and understanding the physical world, uh, secure and alive. That this is this is all all kind of problems that our mind uh, thinks of and. Sort of generate solution. And now he talks about the mind organ, and uh, that mind is a system of organs of computation. And he explains for various examples, and such that saying is an example, thinking an example, a emotion of things and emotions of people, how they are different, how we perceive it, it it matters, uh, and and how it matters to the mind. And why they were important. If you see current uh, definitions of mind and brain, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. what, what, mind is what, like, do you, what do you say? Mind is like a software, brain is like a hardware. Yes, there's that. But I think the important thing, can you back up? Uh, is this what, that one? Yeah. Mind is a system of, of organs of computation. computation. And this was a point that I had try to make we yeah. really don't think of this and i think that's fairly consistent now with contemporary um cognitive model the specialized areas that do specialized things whereas what you guys tend to do is one system for modeling yeah. everything and the reason this is important is that there are constraints within the individual organs that guide processing so to to answer your question, because he does also says that the brain is the hardware and the yeah. and the mind is the software. Yes. It's not about how uh, how a player will play the uh, uh, play the audio. It's about how it is embedded also, and how it is to your ears in a way. So that's mind, and the player itself is just a hardware that plays it. So uh, he draws an example of. Uh, seeing billions of values of light intensities at various locations on antenna, a two-dimensional projection of uh, it it takes that two-dimensional projection of uh, these things on our retina and it, it understand it gives back a three-dimensional world to us. So seeing as an example of uh, computation that goes on in our mind, uh, the and uh, to to see if if you don't agree with me then you can agree with me in this point that uh, that he says that uh, the deeper the patch in retina the steeper the angle and dip, and that defines the three dimensional space so uh, the illusion of televisions comes from that the the illusion that uh, on which televisions are based on that a glass sheet which makes us think that the image contrast is showing a picture of a three dimensional space or a, or a theater per se, which is displayed on a glass sheet because of the angles of the lights that that comes to us, it draws an image of the three dimensional space. And uh, the second example, thinking as a cognitive need. Man, he first goes on by describing a man. A man is animal so lost in rapturous contemplation of what they think he has to uh, he has to overlook what he, he <coughs> indoubtedly wants to be. So man is a question from that. Yeah. Indubitably means necessarily un undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Yeah. So so we see the man is is in the thinking of itself is what is uh, shown here and that uh, and that why the cognitive needs were required in order uh, to perform better in environment. We see the world as stable, law-abiding about objects that obey physical laws of nature. We don't see something uh, uh, which is not possible by physical laws of nature. And uh, for the explain, uh, for that's that's how we see things, and we don't draw 
uh, institutional psychology as uh, institute psychology as this should have feeling or and that this should like uh, like mountains on trees that it should uh, it, it be like trees grows and have those things but we don't see them as a uh, as an emotional being, we just see them as a physical law, as as a as a abiding object that obeys physical law of nature. Second uh, uh, thing that the mind does is there is nothing particular in terms when it comes to uh, engineering in terms of uh, intuitive engineering. Like for example, take a chair. It can be made of anything, but it is designed to hold a human being at its back what intuitive we have that sort of intuitive engineering to design things that are supposed to be uh, uh, that was supposed to be intuitively uh, designed to do it it does not matter what uh, what, what it is made of so we we kind of have that intuitive engineering and and uh, thinking process which is a which is a product of uh, mind processing and uh, thinking as intuitive psychology also the behavior is caused by beliefs and desire that's why we understand people by asking what they want rather than seeing them as mechanical object which is which is just running around here and there and there is a one hack to it that well, we believe in uh, ghosts and spirits as a ghost and spirits as a result of this intuitive psychology that that are mind without bodies so we think of something which has a mind but we that doesn't have a body it sort of uh, shows that we we are capable of doing that and and we are capable of uh, defining a, a person which is which does not hold a body but uh, but holds a mind so this is a sort of construct uh, that our mind does is is in the form of intuitive psychology uh, that we we have this sort of intuition of uh, other people's psychology and mind and ours itself. I don't know about ghosts and other things. What people are doing. Uh, let me put my opinion. Okay. See, I I don't. I'm an atheist. I don't believe God. Or anything. Yes. But I I like the idea of ghosts. It's very romantic. Yeah. <laughs> but why do you believe in you know, it? Is the answer for that. I I have my answer. Just I like it. The idea is very yes, good. but but he explains <laughs> that because we see uh, we believe in uh, beliefs and desires mm -hmm. and sort of ghosts and ghosts and spirits are are some entity which does not have a body but have a mind. We sort of construct that construct this concept on our own because we are built to do that. Yeah. We are built to behave in, in such a way. We have intuitive psychology. So this is the word that he used, presumably, right? Yeah. Okay. Another word for this is called folk psychology. Folk psychology. Um, okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of amused that he felt Use. compelled to have a different term because we've been using the word folk psychology for this all the time. Um, but this does connect with a sort of a Dennett view that goals and intentionality are epiphenomenal, in other words, imposed on physical entities and not really a uh, causal okay. in their behavior. So there should there should be a Dennett citation in here someplace and maybe a Steve Stitch citation. Yeah, I love it. I is very what superficial like well yeah but that's his that's his point is that there's a full psychology that's the term that we typically use that that uh imposes intentionality on physical entities and because of that it's possible for the intentionality piece <laughs> to be detached from a physical entity yes and so you, know, you can have this intentionality thing <laughs> that doesn't have a physical body. Does that make sense? Do you see what, what's happening? It's it, we call it epiphenomenal. It's not really it's not really there. It's not really attached to human beings or any physical entity. It's something that we impose on agents. Yeah, but so, I believe most people are don't believe in ghosts or just like think about ghosts is not because of our obsession. Physical, 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 
uh, so that, could be. I mean, this is a, this is one of the great mysteries of where where is consciousness if it's not associated with the physical realization. People are worried about that. Yes, but again, folk psychology. You know the kind the, the kinds of psychological processes that you use and you think explain human behavior, as opposed to the way psychologists think about human behavior. So next point that he makes is uh, the disgust. Why why do we disgust about something eating something and other things are very okay too out of all the animal parts of all the species there are tiny leaves that we consider palatable and any other thing is revolting to our mind let's say we we eat uh, fish we eat chicken we eat lot of things but uh, as as said if you if you have to eat worms it will you'll go on a level of disgust there that this that is disgusting so how 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 came how we came to be as as at this point is human beings face a omnivore dilemma that uh, humans have a very large menu and many of them can be dangerous so this disgust is basically a food poisoning deterrent so what what, what it's uh, uh, what it means is that let's say if you are grown in a household where uh, you are eating a uh, we are you are allowed to eat non vegetarian food just because your parents eat it it's okay for you to eat that but mostly uh, if you are in a in a vegetarian household it will it will sound disgusting to you uh, it's not your problem it's vegan it's okay so um there's another view there's another explanation of this and the the source is one of my favorite, favorite books of all time, Marvin Harris, Good to Eat. And he describes the grounding of good to eat in the ecology, the ecological environment. So there are places where it's good to eat insects, mm -hmm. even though we don't think it's good but to still, eat. But still the author says that even to them, some of the food may be taboo that are- Well, not yeah, yeah, sure, but there's, but there's an ecological, foundation for this that gets built into the culture yes. so in the in the places where it's good to eat insects yeah. typically they would be overrun with insects if they weren't good to eat yes. and in places where it's not good to eat meat it's because the um deficiency of of cattle ranching would be you know prohibitively expensive and so it's better to have a vegetarian culture to get more calories out of the land. So there's a there's a sort of a sociocultural <coughs> view on this that I, I, I would say is not um, central to the way Pinker thinks about things. And he doesn't he doesn't have a sociocultural view when he talks about Just language. Not ecological, but it's religious religion. Well, that yeah, gets that the, gets tied up yeah. in there. The religion yeah, the is, you know, the people who shape up religion. Yeah, they were very intelligent at that age. Yeah, and they developed this. You know, they motivated people to not eat that yeah. because they understand this ecological cycle. Yeah, uh, even and that's why this. Yeah, how this is the way it's shaped. Yeah. and then you know things like um, fish liver is really good to eat in Scandinavian countries. Why? I mean, it's awesome. Awesome. disgusting. But you know, um, why is it good to eat? Because it's very high in vitamin D. Yeah. And they don't get a lot of sun. Yeah. So there's a there's a sort of a sociocultural explanation for some of these things that I find always missing in Pinker's work. So the thinking, the point that it makes and draws uh, to the to the mental organ of the mind or the what's the work of mind here is that the mind sort of understands the uh, uh, what microorganisms. Just join analogy. Rajasthan, you know? Rajasthan, you know, in the hot summer, there are people who actually distribute servers, right? Mm -hmm. and they think they are doing, you know, good things yes. in, the, in the eyes of God and so on. So that's you know, extreme hot weather. If you go to Scandinavia, uh, so in churches, there are hot soups and you know, uh, you know, uh, coffees and etc. is available all the time. Mm -hmm. So anybody is passing through, they can have it. So they also believe that they are good, you know, doing good for people. Mm -hmm. So see, you know, it's not about religion. It's about the 
you know, ecology yeah. and, the, and the system yeah. and, the, and the environment, and they tune it that. <laughs> so another form of business that he that he uh, shares is that if an innocent object that is a disgusting object, then it becomes disgusting. So let's say you have a coffee and somebody to stir it in, instead of a instead of a straw to stir or a spoon to stir. If somebody stir it with the remote or something, it becomes disgusting because you can't eat the remote. Then you can't drink the coffee anymore. <laughs> so it. It sort of he says that uh, uh, the idea of microorganism and uh, and the, the things uh, that the bacteria are there were not invented, but our mind somehow comprehended that it's bad. So it the the uh, this kind of emotion which is called disgust. Yeah. Another you know set of good work maybe I already can have So. Why human is human? Why are we laughing? What, mm -hmm. what makes us laugh at human? So even there are quite a few good theories like benign theories and etc. All those are you know, really interesting. Yes. So uh, further explaining it, explain love, like emotions for, for people. Uh, the sec he says he explains passion or the extreme feeling of love and why, why it is required in evolution and why it is here and why the mind uh, Think that that was certain kind of thing that has to be done. Think of it as the sacrifice of freedom and rationality, sometimes give an advantage in promises, threats, and bargains. So let's say, let's say there is a couple. They they have seen each other. They have met a bunch of people, and they have settled down to certain two people that they found best for each other. It if if a rational mind think in all in uh, all its rationality it will think that if you find out someone better i'll leave him or her for for the other person right so that's why the romantic love or passion was uh, important in in the construct of mind that it gives you uh, it gives you uh, advantage of promise and it gives you advantage of that the person will stick together uh, and that is a guarantor of uh, of spending your life with someone and forsake all of this. So that's uh, that a sort of construct that the mind uh, makes for us in order to uh, in, in order to be uh, to be efficient. So and uh, yep. So what happens if uh, you break that construct or? Uh, uh, or you break that promise or threat, it it goes in a negative direction, and you have extreme feeling of vengeance. So it's a it's a kind of guarantor that if you don't keep up your promise, that my threats are not loves. If you break the promises, then thus you get a feeling like vengeance. So these are defined like that. So you and in terms of passion or vengeance or love, you lose all the rationality in order to secure your promises and the works that best for the advantages. So that's why you have this kind of feelings. Is this author is trying to explain everything? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to agree with you. I'm, li I'm listening to this. I've not read this particular book. I've read a fair amount of paper. Um, and he's certainly straying from his scholarly foundations in covering topics like this. I'm quite he, surprised. He, yeah. he sort of made this book for the general that, audience. That, yeah, he's so why I, I also <laughs> thought that, okay, it's a great book for community science. And I sort of agree to the point also. Well, if, but we have to look out of the window of the AI itself and sort of what he's doing is reverse engineering the mind itself to to construct up uh, uh, to, yeah, const but, to construct something which which is intelligent itself. Yeah, so but, in order to make something, you'll have to understand yourself. That's what is. Yeah, but he's kind of going the Jordan Peterson route, and and that doesn't make me very happy. Yes, <laughs> I do understand that. Right. Now, now he is perfectly capable of good scientific argumentation. I use the book The Language Instinct when yes. I teach psycholinguistics. It's excellent. It's outstanding. It's well grounded. Um, I haven't looked at this book. I don't see. But we cannot put emotions into robots, right? I mean, yeah, but but I wouldn't if I if I were to look up affect and emotion. Steve Pinker is not the guy I would turn to <laughs> yeah. for that topic. So I, I'm. This is interesting, but I'm. 
I'm surprised, very surprised. And the battery is running out on the computer. Here. It's, it's fine, it's fine, it's mine. Oh, okay. So the conclusion he says that mine is a system of computer that is designed by natural selection to promote sur uh, survival. Sure. Uh, mine is a product of brain and brain is a product of evolution. Yeah. So that's how we, it's, it stays up. Mine is a, a computer, a system of computer, that's pretty bad. That is 1997. Yeah, it's 1997 on it. But initially, you argue that mind is a system of organs, each of mental organs, yes. Now you're saying it's a system. So, those mental organs, so it is one computer. Yeah, that's that's another yeah. system. Yeah, system. Yeah, so one system. issue. Yeah, yeah. Computer is useful, something you get out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you put some input into the mind, you will get out, right? No, no, not I mean, you have like there is an action for every there is a reaction for every action. Our mind is just like uh, we can control whatever you want to control, but there is a reaction for every action. Uh, that that's a mind going haywire. I don't know. I mean, I have a different point to add here. So this evolution actually, you know, I can think about. There was a tons of work in computer science for evolutionary computation. Genetic algorithms and etc. And people did a lot of work in 1970s, etc. But this was more free, probably gone extinct now. I mean, it might come back in the future or so on, I don't know. But those theories and etc. people did a lot of work on that. But I don't see any more, any more work with that area now. So in AAA, there was a session on it, so it's still going on. Oh, Is some it? people are doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's Genetic it. algorithms in particular? Genetic algorithms. So, he sort of explains his three points and conclusion that mind is not just a crude drive of reflexes and controllable energy and rather engineering software which keeps optimizing uh, legacy of biology which is not just territorial imperative senseless reproduction to replicate but has given us kind a kind of gentler emotion like friendship and sense of justice and specialization the mind is not just a single substance that partly uh, but a partly autonomous and Competing parts, competing parts that outsmart each other. So that's all. Hmm. Thank you. Well, I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised to see them wandering in territory like this. So for the friendship and justice stuff, um, there's a whole line of work um, on moral psychology and moral reasoning that would be relevant to that. Um, there's social identity theory that is a good foundation for understanding those processes. I'm not hearing you talk anything about that. Um, so, so the things that uh, I sort of uh, agreed with him is uh, in the first chapter itself, he speaks about the robots and how do we see robots and why it is not possible as computer scientists, we can, we can agree on it also that the way uh, it's, it, the way it will process it just numbers and in order to making a robot we'll have to think of uh, how can how can it do uh, certain thing which uh, which uh, which a human will do for certain example let's think of a uh, dilemma in uh, a in a in a boat where only two people can survive mm -hmm. uh, only one people can survive and the, the the robot has to make the sacrifice for that <laughs> He draws an analogy on that. So how do you say that? How do you uh, tell him that you have to sacrifice yourself? Uh, first, it, first it did was uh, it was sacrificing itself for equal weight. So it will sacrifice itself for a stack of food, which is not good. His life is more than the stack of food. Then he says that, okay, what to do next? Uh, let's say if I understand the feature of a uh, phase, then maybe I can say that uh, I should sacrifice myself for that. So then he then he sacrifices himself for a doll also. So this is sort of a construct that he's trying to explain that uh, in order to make a system intelligent, we'll have to back the reverse back and think of all this complex stuff that human mind and human uh, nature have been gone through all this time in order to uh, to do uh, what a robot or what a AI is supposed to do. In more in terms of a gender AI rather than the AI that we see today. Mm -hmm in terms of those lines. Mm -hmm. So that's why his ideas may not convey 
uh, as beautiful as what we see right now okay it's writing amazing numbers or letters but to make a general ai he 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 discusses the point and analogies from human mind and human brain how do we do agi you know, so, there are also, you know, you know two school of thought. Some people believe in AJ, some people don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a, have a, just a small comment here. You know, there was a time people 